Hi, hello, you can get videos like this early on my Patreon. Okay, let's start the video. Dracula, the Frankenstein monster, the mummy, the wolfman. These four monsters headlined Universal's horror filmography in the 30s and 40s. By the 50s, these monsters were past their prime, so Universal needed a new monster for a new era, and they found it in 1954 with the success of Creature from the Black Lagoon. Science couldn't explain it, but there it was, alive, in the deep, deep waters of the Amazon. This was the atomic age of science fiction, movies about creatures influenced by man's arrogance running amok, and the Gill Man, as he's known, fits the bill. Man would intrude on his home, experiment on him in later movies, and he would go on a rampage. There was usually a girl getting carried off too. The creature's appearance was designed by Millicent Patrick, and was consistently portrayed by Rico Browning for the underwater sequences in all three films, which I'd imagine was a very stressful performance. The creature is a sympathetic character, as we'll soon see. He's incapable of speech, but there are always things happening to it that makes the human characters less likable. Today I'm going to be looking at all of Universal's Gilman movies, seeing where they started and how they kinda ended on a whimper. Let's get right into it. The first movie, Creature from the Black Lagoon, begins with the discovery of a strange hand embedded in a stone in the Amazon. Later, a descendant of the owner of the hand, the Gilman, shows up and murders the two men stationed to guard it. No. <laughs> When a scientist returns with the team, they investigate further by traveling deep into the Amazon, reaching a small area known as the Black Lagoon. From here on out, the scientists repeatedly encounter the Gill Man, who roughhouses with the team a little and takes an interest in the girl of the group. The creature has a startling theme song and, brother, by the end of the movie you're gonna remember it. It's incredibly repetitive, but I'd be lying if I said it didn't grow on me. The rest of the soundtrack is apparently taken from other Universal movies too, and I think it's impressive how they made it all sound cohesive and consistent. The underwater cinematography is darn good for the time. There's a lot of scenes dedicated to aimlessly searching for the creature underwater. Too many if you ask me, but they look nice especially when compared to the copycats that followed this movie, which tried to replicate the underwater visuals to worse effect. The film was originally shot with 3D in mind, so the bubbles clustering the frame were there to enhance the effect. Surprisingly, it's not terribly distracting. With a lot of 3D movies, there's usually a moment or two where the camera hangs on a shot for just a little too long. But the few instances where it happens here aren't too distracting. It doesn't feel like they're stopping the movie for it, unlike in, say, Jaws 3D. These long stretches of swimming, endless swimming, are eventually broken by... And moments like that work. This is a solid... creature feature, for lack of a better term. It's not groundbreaking, but it's a movie with a number of action scenes that keep it entertaining, the creature's lair at the end makes for a memorably spooky set. The human characters aren't anything to write home about, but the Gill Man is a remarkable creature for the time, really, during a time when other movies had guys in monster suits that looked like this. The creature was comparatively realistic. This movie's a little cheesy, but it was a breath of fresh air for Universal, so their next course of action was to run the character of the Gill Man into the ground. A little over a year later, Revenge of the Creature released to American cinemas. Picking up almost immediately after the end of the last movie, the boat captain from the last movie, the only returning character, brings in another expedition team to capture the creature. When their first attempt doesn't work, they resort to blowing up the pond- OH MY GOD! When captured, they subject it to a fate worse than death, as an attraction at SeaWorld. <laughs> Well, it's not actually SeaWorld, but it's a place where they exhibit sea animals. In the 50s! I hope you ain't going to blow up my boat, Mr. Johnson. Like my wife, she's not much, but she's all I have. <laughs> wife bad. Clint Eastwood makes a surprising cameo as a lab assistant, 
It's a small role, and you wouldn't guess that he would go on to have a successful career. The greatest scientific find since the Peking Man. What you got, Mac? Someone on Earth a natural blonde? Damn, there's a lot of locker room talk in this one. What I'd give for a tall, cold beer. Or a short, warm blonde. Women, am I right, fellas? Please procreate. So yeah, the creature arrives at the oceanary, he falls in love with a girl, gets cucked, and eventually breaks loose from his captivity and goes on a rampage, ending in a scene where he carries the girl off. It's more or less the same shtick, but this time there's a little more Florida-themed carnage. It's the same, but more. The gill man has broken out of his tank. Clear the area. The creature is more sympathetic in this one. Dude's just showed up and dragged him to some scary place he doesn't know and all he wants to do is go home. Naturally, he starts a shit fit and he does try to hurt people, so he's not completely reasonable, but he acts the way a scared animal would, and that makes him more pitiable. They even chain him up, but they do give him a little basket in case he ever wants to go shopping. This was one of the few Universal monster movies, one of the few classic ones at least, that was featured on Mystery Science Theater 3000. It definitely feels more in line with the movie they would feature on there than the first one. That's my cue! While the first movie may have overused the Gill Man theme, this one returns to decisively beat it to death. It's got more lighthearted elements. There's a scene early on with a funny little chimp, and it comically punctuates the dolphin feeding scene with musical flourishes. The dialogue here is comically stilted. Most of the kids I went to undergraduate school with are already married and have children. Is that what you want? I don't know. The script is groan worthy. Hi. I don't care what the joke writers say. It takes longer for a man to dress. You got more to put on. <laughs> the poor Gill Man suit has gotten a little worse since last time. He doesn't have the same highlights that gave the last suit its believability. He's got this permanently shocked expression, like he knows he's in a subpar sequel. For some reason, this movie feels the need to have three false jump scares, and none of them work. Like, come on, that's not gonna work. Unless it's revealed when the character walks into frame that they're actually the Gill Man wearing a human hand or something. For some reason, these dipshits think it's a good idea to go swimming when there's a killer fish man on the loose. You'd think this decision would bite them in the ass, but the Gill Man bides his time and instead follows them so he could kidnap the girl later. How cunning. <laughs> The characters in the first movie weren't terribly interesting, but the ones in this movie are just completely flat. John Agar, as an actor, is wooden as always. Ms. Dobson, what are you doing for dinner tonight? Well, I haven't thought about it, sir. Then that's it. Now, where are you staying? A lot of elements in the sequel don't add up to anything more than subpar. It trades in the atmosphere and cool sets for a tacky tie-in. It's got some plotting pacing until the last 20 minutes when the creature escapes. It's still got some clean underwater cinematography, but the Black Lagoon was a more visually interesting location. The concrete floor of an aquarium just isn't as interesting. It is something new, I guess. The movie does have a corny charm to it, and it's a hell of a lot more entertaining than other B-movies of its time. The scenes of carnage where the Gill Man is on the loose are quite fun. The Very much more in line with a generic monster movie. Not as good as the first one. Sadly, the quality of the movies didn't get much better with the Gill Man's final outing, which released the next year as the creature walks a... a... um... Uh -oh. The creature approaches our vicinity. At this point, I'm really sick of the creature theme. Dude, I warned you, I said I was going to do that if you did that again. Though, in fairness, there aren't as many opportunities for the filmmakers to spam it. I think it's really telling here that Gilman's introduction is through stock footage. Picking up after the last movie, the Gilman is landlocked, which means he is unfortunately doomed to live in Florida. To make matters worse, he is hunted by a pack of roaming humans. 
I'm surprised this man still has an ass after how many bullets grazed it. Rather than letting him die a peaceful death after setting him ablaze, scientists perform surgery to make the Gill Man more human. See, it's discovered that he has a pair of perfectly usable lungs, and by training him, they could integrate the creature into human society. The surgery wasn't necessary, as Gilman inexplicably begins to rapidly mutate into something more human. He gains a clunky Frankenstein's monster type of body with broad shoulders. Yeah, I have no idea why they thought this was a good look for him. They're changing the iconic look and it doesn't work. He becomes more man than Gil. The mutation theory does explain why he looks shittier with each film at least. See, this is actually a pretty cool premise for a movie, trying to force a creature from the past to conform to modern society when, really, it should be left alone, even if it is partially human. But it was unfortunately wasted on the creatures near our current location. This movie has this creature conformity plotline happening in tandem with everyone's favorite story archetype, Domestic abuse. Yay. The script isn't as bad as the last movie. The acting here is overall a little better too. Jeff Morrow plays an awfully mean scientist who's abusive towards his wife, and he's effectively understated yet unpleasant. The scene where the Gill Man awakens from surgery is even a little creepy. The underwater scenes are, again, well shot. By now I'm getting pretty sick of how obvious the padding is, though. They're not tense, they're not suspenseful. Now, as I was writing this review, I initially thought that every single shot of the creature during this sequence was stock footage. All the swimming sequences in these movies look the fucking same. It ends with this lady going unconscious. What the fuck was even the point of all that? Sorry I made so much trouble. There is something about how her swimming gives her freedom from her abusive husband, but the movie doesn't go any further than that, and it's the only scene of swimming in the movie. Even with a more ambitious script tackling more Frankenstein-esque themes and domestic abuse, the film lacks a proper thrust. Something for me to care about. There's also something about how the more civilized we become, the less violent we are. And that comes to a head towards the end of the movie when Jeff Morrow murders a guy and then tries to pin it on the creature who has otherwise become non-violent. But that's towards the end of the movie and I've long since stopped caring. I don't like most of these characters and I just wish the Gill Man would get rid of Jeff Morrow already. Even the other love interest this lady has isn't the most pleasant alternative. It's hard not to feel bad for her. The Gilman actually saves her from this prick's advances. In the grand scheme of the whole series, the Gilman is the one suffering the hardest here. In the last movie, he got bombed and dragged to Florida, everyone's favorite state. Then he was set on fire and mutilated. And at the end of the movie, he can't even swim home to the ocean. He lost the ability to breathe underwater during the surgery and mutation. It's genuinely tragic, and the movie did intend for that to be the case. What was probably unintentional was him being the only likable character in the movie. It takes until the last six minutes for one of Gilman's rampages. The rest of the movie cannot keep my attention. It's unfortunately rather boring. The end of this movie signaled the end of Universal's classic run of monster movies. They would make more horror and science fiction movies, sure, but they never quite had another star for their pantheon of creatures. It was a depressing and lame end to an era. It wasn't the end for poor Gilman, however. About a decade later, he would finally adapt to human society and become Uncle Gilbert and star in the Munsters, opening up a new string of sequels where he would deal with his trials and tribulations of being an unwilling American citizen. And he would live on into the present day through copious amounts of merchandise. And with that, I would like to give a very special mention to my $5 patrons. It's Godzi, Big Odilo, An Actual Demetrodon, Space Hunter M, CMG, Red Comet Harry, and Marpzilla. Thank you very much.
That's Mike Q.